Hello guys, welcome back to my channel and uh, today we are going to discuss about human physiology or normal physiology and uh, we will start with the very interesting or rather very difficult topic for everybody that is the nervous system. We will discuss about the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, the types of neurons, how action potential is generated, how is it transferred and various other things. So we will start with the nervous system which is divided into CNS and PNS that is the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is further divided into it consists of brain and the spinal cord whereas the peripheral nervous system it has two divisions sensory and motor. The motor division is again divided into somatic and autonomic and the autonomic is divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So what does the central nervous system do? It is responsible for integration, processing, coordinating, sensory data and motor commands. So the brain and the spinal cord is basically responsible for interpreting the sensory response which comes from our various effector organs and in return they give out a motor command so that the action can take place. Similarly when we come to the peripheral nervous system so it includes all other neurons which is outside the central nervous system. There is the sensory division it's what does it do? It brings information to CNS from the receptor organ. So here it is also known as the voluntary and the motor when we come they carry the command from CNS to the effector system. So the motor is divided into somatic and autonomic. The somatic is of the voluntary control which consists of the skeletal muscles. We see the action mostly in the skeletal muscles and the autonomic which is the involuntary right. So the autonomic is again divided. It consists of smooth muscles heart glands and adipose tissues. So we cannot control our own heartbeat or we cannot control the movement of our visceral organs such as the peristalsis. It cannot be controlled by us. So it comes under autonomic involuntary. Now further it is divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic right. We will discuss about that in detail. Then let's come to the sensory part. Sensory part has three divisions. The somatic sensory special, the somatic sensory visceral receptor and the somatic sensory receptors. So in special it has special functions like smell, taste, vision, balance, temperature and various other features. For the visceral receptors it consists of the balance of internal organs not as in the balance balance but it is just the internal conditions of the organs like everything is in check. Next let's come to the receptors. So this has touch, position, proprioception, pain and pressure. So this is basically the summarization of how the nervous system is divided into our body. Further we can come to sympathetic and parasympathetic also they have actions on various other organs uh, which I have thought already while studying pharmacology and uh, now we will come to the structure of a neuron. So this is how the neuron looks. It has a cell body also known as the cyton. This long thing is called as the axon. The cell body has dendrites and the nucleus and it also has tiny ribosomes which is called as the missiles granules. They synthesize protein. Next is the axon. There are two types of neuron. One is the myelinated neuron, the other one is non-myelinated neuron. So this is a myelinated neuron because it has myelin sheet and each myelin sheet consists of Schwann cells and the gap between them is called as the node of Ranvier. So what happens over is saltatory conduction takes place. So what is saltatory is the impulse jumps from one node of Ranvier to the other node of Ranvier, right? That's called saltatory conduction. This is why and it is fast and this myelin sheet is nothing but it is adipose tissue and it is basically for the protection of the neuron. Then coming here this is a synaptic knob. So this consists of the neurotransmitters. It can be excitatory inhibitory various the neurotransmitters. And this is the dendrite. So what does the dendrite do? Dendrite is responsible for the catching of the signals. Dendrites catch the signals. So uh, uh, interesting thing or important thing cluster of cell bodies or cluster of cell bodies or cyton in the central nervous system is called nuclei whereas the same cluster is called ganglia. We will be using the term ganglia very frequently when we refer to PNS. So just remember ganglia is nothing but a cluster of cell bodies but that is outside the CNS. It is called as ganglia. So these are the few structures of three types of three to four types of neurons. One is a multipolar neuron, bipolar neuron, pseudo unipolar neuron. Unipolar also looks same but except for this part is removed. So what is a multipolar neuron? So it can carry signals from CNS to muscles, glands and many it has many processes right but a single axon. Example is spinal neurons, the pyramidal and Purkinje cells. So Purkinje cells I can I will attach the image somewhere here. So it is a neuron which has multiple, it has millions of dendrites. It can catch many signals right. 
Next is a bipolar neuron. As the name suggests, bipoles. It has two poles. So it carries message from body that is maybe eye, ear, or olfactory to the CNS, right? So it basically does the sensory function, right? Example: the olfactory epithelium or the retinal cells. Next is the unipolar. It has one process from the cell body, and it is present mainly in the spinal and the cranial nerve ganglia, right? Next is the pseudo unipolar neuron. So what does the pseudo unipolar neuron do? It is a sensory neuron in the PNS, in the peripheral nervous system. This is a sensory neuron. It has one axon which splits into two parts, right? One runs to the peripheral part, and the other runs to the spinal cord. So one part is running to the spinal cord. The other runs to the peripheral part. So this is how uh, we classify the types of neuron. And after this, we will see uh, what is a sensory neuron, what is a motor neuron, and what is an effector neuron. So guys, let's continue with the classification of neurons, or specifically the function of the neuron. So we have sensory motor and associative neurons, right? So what is a sensory motor, a sensory neuron? As the name suggests, it senses something. It is also called as an efferent neuron because it is present in the sensory organs. From the sensory organs, it brings the stimulus to the central nervous system where it can be processed. So there are two types, unipolar and bipolar. Unipolar can be found in the skin and other visceral organs, whereas bipolar can be found in specific uh, organs such as the retina or the olfactory epithelium. So they are the locations of the unipolar and the bipolar neurons or the sensory neurons, right? Next, let's come to motor neuron. What is motor neuron? It's also called as an efferent neuron because it brings the command from the central nervous system to the effector organ. So from the CNS to the organ. So these are basically multipolar neurons. So one classical example for this is the neuromuscular junction where the neuron is located within the central nervous system, but the effector neuron is located at a neuromuscular junction. It forms a neuromuscular junction, junction or a synapse where the or, or specific action can be performed by transmission of neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine. Next is an association neuron. So these are also called as interneuron or they are called the relayed neurons, right? So these are present within the CNS and uh, they are 99% multipolar neurons itself. And uh, uh, they are multipolar neurons and some neurons with the body. They are present within the CNS. So one such example for it, this is the relay center of the brain, corpora quadra gemina, which consists of a maximum of interneurons, which is a relay center between the left and the right hemisphere so that they can communicate with each other. Now coming to a bit of histology, what is present in the PNS, what is present in the CNS. So I have made a schematic representation and I'll explain you. So neuroglia, so right, this neuroglia, our CNS consists of, our nervous system basically consists of neurons and neuroglia. Neurons are the functional unit or the functional cells, whereas neuroglia is responsible for the repair and protection of the neurons. So in the peripheral nervous system, there are two types. That is the satellite cells and the Schwann cells. So what do the satellite cells do? So they surround the cyton in ganglia, right? So as I told you, in PNS, a cluster of neurons is called ganglia. So they cover the cyton or the cell body, right? Regulation of oxygen, carbon dioxide and various other nutrients. And they also control the levels of neurotransmitters within the ganglia. Next is the Schwann cells. We might be very familiar with this. They surround the axon in the PNS, also called as the myelin sheet. This is how it looks. It is hollow from inside. It is lipid in nature and they participate in repair process. So they take part in the repair of the neuron. And yes, uh, with this we can associate a disease which is the multiple sclerosis. So what happens over there is the Schwann cells degraded. It, uh, the R WBCs attack on the Schwann cells which leads to the destruction of the Schwann cells and which leads to delayed impulse transmission, right? Multiple sclerosis is a disease related to degeneration of the myelin sheet. Myelin sheet of the Schwann cells, it causes the degeneration of it because of attack of the WBC or autoimmunity. Next, coming to the central nervous system, right? This has oligodendrocytes, ependymocytes, astrocytes and microglia. So what do oligodendrocytes do? Similar function of Schwann cells, but they form myelin around the neurons in the CNS in the CNS. This was in PNS, this is in CNS and they provide structural support. Next is the astrocytes. So what they do is they maintain the blood brain barrier, very important cells. They regulate ion and nutrition in and around the neuron, absorption and recycle of neurotransmitters. They recycle neurotransmitters and form a scar after an injury. We can, if you would have studied uh, morphology, you can see or even in histology, you can see astrocyte scar. So they form a scar also. Scar is a process of repair. 
when a wound is healing by a secondary intention where the viable cells are not present so a scar has to be formed right so here scar formation takes place next is the ependymal cells the what they do is they line the brain ventricles right they line the brain ventricles and they also help in the production and the circulation of csf so these are epithelial cells they are ciliated right so they can with the movement of the cilia they can help the movement of the central uh, cerebrospinal fluid next is the microglia in simple words microglia is nothing but it is the wbc of the central nervous system so what they do they move cell debris waste pathogens by phagocytosis what is phagocytosis cell eating phenomena the cell is completely engulfed after forming a vacuole right so these are basically microglia is nothing but the wbc of the central nervous system you can remember it that way so this is the histology of the cells present in the pns and the cns in the schematic representation now let's come to the types of synapse so what is a synapse in simple words where two neurons meet either it can be a neuron neuron it can be the neuron or the muscle or it can be a neuron and a gland right so this is a neuron neuron synapse a neuron with another neuron so what happens over here is the axon right the axon along with the synaptic vesicles and the synaptic knob touches with the dendrites of the second neuron this is neuron 1 this is neuron 2 so the synaptic knobs are in contact with the dendrites right this is a synapse this is a neuron neuron synapse next is a neuromuscular junction as i told you so this is a neuron this is the skeletal muscle so over here the neuromuscular junction is formed this is the telodendrite and this is the synaptic terminal so what happens is acetylcholine comes over here and gives the uh, gives the stimulation whether the muscle has to contract or relax based on whether acetylcholine is coming in or going out next is the neuro glandular synapse so what happens over here is similar to neuromuscular but over here there is a gland present so the gland produce suppose the goblet cells i have taken example which is responsible for the secretion of mucus so here goblet cells uh, release the mucus on getting a stimulus from this these neurons also have dendrites yes don't confuse please so these are the three types of synapse and we have two more that is one of them is called as chemical and the other one is electrical so in chemical what happens is neurotransmitters acetylcholine gaba dopamine various other neurotransmitters take place over here glutamate and in electrical synapse it is the charge which is moving charge which is which i refer to as sodium and potassium right sodium potassium and chloride so there are two types chemical or uh, electrical the one which you see always the saltatory conduction that is an electrical signal whereas you see when neurotransmitters are released on the effector organ that is a chemical synapse right so these are the two types chemical and electrical and uh, further let's discuss about the synapse right so guys uh, let's continue with the classification of neurotransmitters based on their chemical nature and their function so we have ester type amino acids amines peptides and other miscellaneous neurotransmitters so ester as we all know acetylcholine right acetylcholine because it is degraded by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase so this is an esteric enzyme acetylcholine next is an amino acid such as glycine gaba gamma amino butyric acid glutamate and aspartate coming to amines there is catecholamines and there is indolamines catecholamines have three things that is epinephrine or adrenaline norepinephrine or noradrenaline and dopamine next is the indolamine which has serotonin histamine and taurine right there are three neurotransmitters coming to the peptide uh, you might know substance p is a very famous example then there is endorphins and there is enkephalins right other such as atp nitric oxide or also certain types of neurotransmitters based upon the function we can classify them into excitatory which is they cause depolarization right inhibitory which cause hyperpolarization and both excitatory and inhibitory that is they cause depolarization followed by an hyperpolarization so for excitatory the examples are glutamate aspartate histamine for inhibitory there is glycine taurine gamma amino butyric acid which cause hyperpolarization which is a inhibitory one then there is excitatory and inhibitory such as acetylcholine adrenaline noradrenaline dopamine and various other miscellaneous neurotransmitters right now let's understand how is the mechanism of action right there are three types of mechanism for neurotransmitter one is the direct one so what happens over here is this is the chemical gated ion channel what happens over here is this is acetylcholine and this has a binding site for acetylcholine 
as we all know there is positive outside and negative inside the cell for depolarization to happen the positive charge has to enter inside the cell is becoming more positive so what happens over here is acetylcholine comes and binds to the receptor this leads to the opening of the chemical channel next what happens is positive charge positive charge i am referring to is potassium enters the cell potassium enters the cell and what happens is neurotransmitter uh, neurotransmitters cause the opening of the channel and hence the neuron impulse can be transmitted example for such is glutamate aspartate and acetylcholine they act by direct effect on the receptors next is indirect by g protein so g protein coupled reaction g proteins uh, help uh, over here so what happens over here is the neurotransmitters they go and bind to the uh, specific site and what they do is they activate g protein g protein activates adenyl cyclase along with atp cyclic amp is synthesized enzyme is activated which leads to the opening of the ion channel right this is indirectly by g protein then there is indirectly by intracellular enzyme so there are certain enzymes are present inside the cell and which can help the reaction to take place so what happens over here is nitric oxide is an uh, example for this so what happens over here nitric oxide enters the cell directly uh, it just diffuses because it's a gas right so it just diffuses and uh, what happens is uh, it enters the cell and it activates the enzyme which produces secondary messenger which opens the ion gated channel so example for this is uh, nitric oxide and carbon monoxide for indirect it can be gaba histamine and substance p and noradrenaline and dopamine also these are the examples for indirect acting g protein uh, they activate g protein and that's how they help in the impulse transmission right now we will uh, discuss about uh, we'll discuss about uh, how uh, epsp and ipsp works right we'll see the certain graphs how depolarization repolarization is taking place and we'll move further with the lecture so guys uh, let's continue with the functional state of a neuron so how a neuron functions so initially the neuron is at rest right so excitation influx is equal to the inhibitory influx next there is state of excitation so some trigger has to happen so what happens over here excitatory influ influence is gr uh, greater over here compared to the inhibitory influence next is the state of inhibition so definitely it will be the opposite of excitation we can see with this graph this is the threshold at uh, negative 55 millivolt and resting is minus 70 so what is threshold that is the minimum amount of stimuli required to gain an action potential firing is called as a threshold that is the minimum amount of energy needed so initially the neuron is its uh, resting state so what happens is an epsp is created right excitation potential is created then here it what happens is this is an ipsp or an inhibitory post synaptic uh, response of the uh, neuron next what happens is furthermore when the action potential is coming in coming in coming in so what happens is excitatory post uh, synaptic uh, in, uh, regulation of the neuron is increasing increasing and what happens at one point it crosses the threshold so once the threshold is crossed what happens is the action potential is generated right after the generation of the action potential again yes the neuron will try to come back to its resting state resting state and then again it is attempting a epsp right and then finally the neuron is at rest so what happened over here is depolarization took place here the hyperpolarization took place again a depolarization took place which led to the firing and then again back the neuron returns to its resting state so with this graph you can understand what an epsp is this is a resting state in -70 millivolts a small spike is generated so that the neuron can reach to its threshold whereas the inhibitory is what when the neuron is already depolarized it has to be it has to attain a resting state after following a hyperpolarization so what do i refer to as depolarization hyperpolarization depolarization is when the cell is in negative state and it attains a higher positive state so that is it is not technically positive but from Minus seventy to minus fifty-five millivolts, it is positive. So what happens over here is potassium influx takes place. Potassium is present outside the membrane of the cell, but what happens is potassium influx takes place and sodium is given out, right? 
for every one potassium entering two sodium is given out so an action potential is generated because of depolarization whereas what happens in hyperpolarization is the potassium moves out and the sodium comes in and after which the cell attains its resting state so with this we can have two types of summation one is the temporal summation and one is the spatial summation so what does the temporal summation states even a single synapse may push the post synaptic cell to threshold if action potential arrives in quick succession providing over and lapping epsp or no excited post synaptic uh, response so what happens over here is if this is an axon and this is a synaptic knob attached to it so this is a dendrite not an axon this is a dendrite of a neuron so simultaneously there is epsp 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 so this can cause a action potential firing right even if one synapse even if one synapse is producing an epsp right so it can cause an action potential firing that's what the temporal summation states whereas the spatial summation what it says three epsp at three different places so here it was just at one place but here what is happening is there is one one two three four let's say so there is epsp from here epsp from here epsp from here so three epsp at different parts of the dendrite they push post synaptic cell to threshold causing an action potential so these push the dendrite to cause an action potential and any epsp and suppose let's mark this as an epsp epsp so any epsp arriving after this right is suppressed by this simple way there is 3 and there is 1 one one can cancel out so there is still two epsp left this is how the special summation works so there is temporal summation there is a special summation next let's come to the inhibition how the uh, transmission is inhibited so this is pre synaptic inhibition and there is post synaptic inhibition so in pre synaptic inhibition what happens is this is an excitatory neuron right this is produce a positive response over here so the action potential travels 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 but at the synaptic junction there is an inhibiting neuron which is producing a negative inf influence which doesn't want the action potential to go so what happens over is neurotransmitters are released but only here and here there is no neurotransmitter over here so what happens is from our target cell there is no response so, and this is very selective inhibition so what happens is the desired cell can be inhibited over here and the other two cells which are not response which are not required or which are not the target cells they can show response but there is no response seen over here because we are blocking it with an inhibiting neuron which is present at this synapse right this synapse this has inhibited it hence there is no response so this is called as pre synaptic inhibition whereas when we come to the post synaptic uh, uh, inhibition what happens over here is so there are two uh, this thing two neurons present at the dendrites at the beginning itself right so what happens this is the synapse so what happens over here one is with excitation the other one is with inhibition so they both cancel out hence there is no response seen in the whole throughout here at least it is selective but here there is no response seen overall so this is nothing but pre synaptic inhibition and this is a post synaptic inhibition this is how the inhibition of the synapse works i hope you guys have understood and we will continue further so guys as we saw pre synaptic and post synaptic inhibition there are few more types of inhibition which i would like you to like to explain these are important from the exam point of view so one is the reciprocal inhibition so what happens here is when the cns has sent a response right in when a cns is sending a response in response to a agonist right suppose uh, there is an agonist coming right or uh, suppose the agonist is that stretch your muscle right so in opposing to that the cns has sent a response in opposing to the agonist which is an antagonist so what would that response be suppose acetylcholine has been released to stretch the muscle but what is happening now is the cns has sent a response to relax the muscle right so here what is happening is contraction and relaxation is taking place simultaneously so i got a response and then again i relaxed it right so that is a reciprocal inhibition right next is an recurrent inhibition so what happens over here is efferent circuit that can decrease the excitability of motor neuron via interneuron right interneuron we have discussed already which is called as an 
Ranch cell, okay. The axon of motor neuron departs one or more collaterals while which go to the inhibiting neuron. I will explain this with this diagram, but let's first come to the lateral inhibition. So what happens in lateral inhibition is the stimulus. What happens? The stimulus is given. The primary neuron responds uh, prop, uh, response proportionally to the stimulus strength. Suppose I take a pin and I prick it exactly at this point of my finger. So I don't feel the pin in entire hand, right? I feel pain specifically to the site of the pin. So that is the primary response. So now what happens? The pathway closes the stimulus inhibition of the neighboring cells. It is not like there is just one uh, nerve cell which is attached at the bottom of my skin. There are ma many of nerve cells, right? There are many nerve cells attached here, but the neighboring pathways are closed. So what happens is the neighboring pathway is closed. And what happens is the inhibition of the lateral neuron enhances the per uh, perception of pain. So if suppose uh, I draw it here, if this is a pin and this is the skin, skin, this is the pin, there is a neuron here, there is a neuron here, there is a neuron here, right? But the pin is pricked to this neuron. So what will happen is the stimulus is coming here, but it is blocked here, it is blocked here. So what happens is the next response which is going over here is intensified. The response is intensified because of the blockage of the lateral neurons, right? So I can show you the example of lateral inhibition is here, right? Lateral inhibition. So this is where the response was given and these two are inhibited because these are the two neurons which are inhibited and primarily the pain is going from here itself. So this is what is lateral inhibition, right? So classic example for this is when a pin pricks you at one particular point. That's lateral inhibition and recurrent inhibition can be seen over here. So there's a stimulus, 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 but it is inhibited over here again. That is what, this is the interneuron which is inhibiting it. So that's how the recurrent inhibition works. This is how lateral inhibition where black marked is excitation and red is inhibition. So that's how, and this is an effector forward excitation. If I replace this with a red dot, if I replace this with a red dot, this would be an inhibition. That's all. Next is reflex. What is reflex? Na natural reaction of an organism to internal or external change carried out by participation of central nervous system in response to the irritation of the receptor. That is what a reflex means. So you might have seen in your 10th and 12th biology book, that right? there is reflex arc diagram where they show the spinal cord is involved, there's motor neuron, there's effector neuron. So when you touch a hot object, immediately you pull back. It is an involuntary action. You didn't think of it, but you feel the pain afterwards, right? It is a very involuntary action to carried out the spinal cord. So that is in reflex arc, that whole scheme which shows is the reflex arc. But then we will study it in a broader perspective. So reflex can be divided by development, by processing, by response and complex circuit. So by development can be innate and acquired. Innate is what which is present with you from genetically, from your, which you have inherited. That is innate. Acquired is when you acquire something. Like if you know the pot is hot, you don't go touch it. That is your acquired one. Innate is from naturally. Like when you go to fall down, you hold your handset over there to protect yourself. That was an innate reflex. Next is by processing. It can be a spinal reflex or a cranial reflex. Reflex arc, spinal reflex is an example. So, uh, by the spinal cord and by the cranial nerves. Next is by response. This can be somatic and visceral. Somatic is again contraction in the skeletal muscles. That is a somatic reflex. So visceral is the contract contraction in the smooth muscles, the beating of the heart and the controlling of the glands. Next is by complex circuit. This can be monosynaptic and polysynaptic. There are two types. So what does the monosynaptic? Has one synapse between different efferent neurons. So if this is the stimulus coming, this is a spinal cord, there is just one synapse and this synapse forwards the signal. This is how it went. But whereas in a polysynaptic what happens is, there are many centers and they transmit response to various places. So in polysynaptic what happens is, has two or more synapses. This somatic motor reflex has both synapses in the central nervous system. Both the synapses are present in the central nervous system. This is a monosynapse and this is a polysynapse. This is how reflexes are divided. And uh, next we will study about feedback mechanism. What is the feedback mechanism? How it works? Why is it necessary? And there are basically two types. The feedback can either be positive or negative. So we will discuss a bit in detail 
how the feedback mechanisms work with this uh, we wrap up for the nervous system and then we will study about the autonomic division that is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system in detail so guys uh, let's continue with the last bit of the chapter or that is the feedback mechanism so principle of feedback mechanism efferent neuron fibers that transmit information about parameters of adaptive reactions of organism to nerve center this is what it means that if there is any change then uh, the feedback mechanism is given whether to continue to it or to oppose to it so there are three things there is a receptor there is a control center and there is a effector organ so it monitors or controls <coughs> control center what it does it determines the next action and effector it receives response from the control system and produces an action where the where it decides whether the uh, response has to be continued or has to be decreased so there are two types there is positive feedback and there is negative feedback so what happens in positive feedback a change is given in direction causing additional change in the same direction in the forward direction concentration of the stimulant is increased so i'll give you an example so what happens during childbirth so fetal ejection reflex causes the childbirth so what happens there is when the uh, uterine myometrium contracts along with the cervix so there is a response given to the cnf that please release oxytocin so more and more of oxytocin is released so oxytocin is causing the fetal ejection reflex already i mean the fetal ejection reflex is already causing to release ox oxytocin uh, in already in a required quantity along with the further uterine contraction the receptor and the control center decide whether to release more oxytocin so if the child birth is taking place more and more of oxytocin is being released right more and more of oxytocin is being released until the baby is delivered and then the positive feedback loop is closed the loop closes right so this was a positive feedback reaction the negative feedback reaction so the change is in opposite direction the stimulant is decreased so what happens over here this is a lot for self control i'll give an example again thermoregulation by the hypothalamus so if a person has fever so what will the body try to do the body will try to come back to its homeostasis condition right that is the normal temperature which is 37 degree centigrade so uh, it is not like if you have got fever that hypothalamus will tell no we need more fever we need more fever and your fever is keep on increasing no that's not the reason your hypothalamus causes thermoregulation fever is caused when the threshold is beaten when the threshold is increased or the homeostasis threshold is increased so hypothalamus will bring down threshold back to 37 degrees celsius so this is the scheme how it works so stimulus this is the variable variable is meant to change right what happens is receptor senses the changes now the control center compares with the reference suppose i told you for like body temperature is 37 degrees celsius but if it senses that the temperature of the body is more then what will this do this will make tell the effector to make certain changes and then this will cause a negative feedback which will go in the opposite direction and the fever will be reduced but again for the same case of the child birth here it takes with the reference and a positive feedback is given so that the child is delivered out so with this we have completed our nervous system we will discuss about the autonomic branch that is the peripheral and the uh, this thing the autonomic nervous system we will discuss in detail we will discuss the peripheral nervous system more in detail somatic autonomic board divisions parasympathetic sympathetic in the next lecture and uh, if you are new to the channel please do like share and subscribe and uh, thank you for watching